The Gospel according to John, chapter 1, verses 43 through 51. Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said to him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? And Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. And Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God descending and ascending upon the Son of Man. Well, there's some things that you just have to experience to believe. But depending on what you're looking for, you may find something you didn't even know you needed. You may not even know what you are looking for. It may feel like you're wandering in darkness until someone shines a light to reveal the way. Or it may be that the light itself is what you always needed. You didn't even know you were wandering in darkness until the light at last reveals it. The disciples were waiting for something, something, someone. But what did they think they were looking for? There wasn't necessarily a single thought about who the Messiah would be or what Messiah would look like. But in general, it seemed like the people were waiting for some sort of hero. They wanted someone of military power and might, anointed and sent by God to overthrow the oppressive Roman government that controlled their lives. They wanted someone to restore the kingdom of Israel and bring it to a place where the throne and the line of David would be restored and last forever. They wanted God to make them the greatest people in the world so that all people would be able to see God through them and that all people would come to God because of them. It was what they thought they needed. But those of us who know the entire story of Jesus know that wasn't what they found in him. They wanted a display of earthly power, but instead they found God's humble servant. They found the light of the world. Now, I love the instantaneous faith of Nathaniel as the Gospel of John describes it. He seems to believe in Jesus simply based on what for Jesus was basically nothing more than a parlor trick. Philip comes to Nathaniel and says, we found the one. We found the one we've been waiting for. We found the one who was foretold. He's from Nazareth. And now automatically, Nathaniel's skeptical. He's from Nazareth. We haven't been looking for or expecting anything out of Nazareth. No one who is anyone is from Nazareth. The Messiah can't be from Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip gives him the same simple invitation that is given to the disciples who came before him. It's the same invitation that is given to every person who encounters Christ. Come and see. Nathaniel goes, but obviously he wasn't expecting very much. But as soon as Jesus sees him, he declares that in Nathaniel there comes one who is without deceit or guile. In other words, I'm sure like with all of the disciples, Jesus looks at Nathaniel's heart and says, Now here is someone who has something that I can work with. Now, Nathanael has never met Jesus before this moment. And yet Jesus declares that he knows who Nathanael is deep down to his core. And Nathanael's amazed by it, just because of a simple display of omniscience. Okay, maybe it wasn't so simple to Nathanael. At some point, I hope we all know what it is like to be known in the way that Nathanael is known by Jesus. Those of us who have felt it, feel it from, say, our spouses or our parents, sometimes even our children and our friends, there is something that they say or do that lets us know that they see us. They truly see us. They get us and understand what makes us who we are, perhaps better than anyone else. And to feel that is simultaneously shocking and exhilarating. It catches you off guard. But at the same time, you feel found and at home. You feel centered and loved and appreciated. It's like a light is switched on perhaps for the very first time, and you can see more clearly than you could before. But Jesus, he seems to brush it off. He seems to say, you think that's impressive? You haven't seen anything yet. 
Follow me and you will see everything clearly. The light will shine in the darkness. You will see heaven open, he says, and you will see the angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Like a light shining behind the curtain, he promises that Nathaniel will see the places where God is at work. He's offering a lived experience, like Jacob's dream, where the heavens were open for him and the angels of the Lord were descending and ascending a great stairway to heaven. And when Jacob woke up, he recognized immediately that something incredible had happened there. And he called the place Bethel, which means simply house of God, because it was one of those places where the veil between heaven and earth had been pulled back and God's presence had been revealed for him. It was as if Christ was saying, follow me, Nathaniel, stick with me, and you will recognize that it is more than simply me knowing your heart. Stick with me and the veil will be pulled back for you. You will recognize the presence of God everywhere. Now, for the Gospel of John, this is all part of what it means for Jesus to be the light of the world. He was and is the light of the world, the light the world needs in the midst of deep darkness to point to God at work. He might not have known it, Nathaniel, but that was what Nathaniel was looking for all along. No matter what he was waiting for, what he needed was to see the presence of a God who is ultimately in control in spite of the chaos life so often brings us. He needed the beacon of a light to be drawn toward and the light to illuminate the way. And perhaps that's what we all need right now. I hear parts of the prologue of John echoing in my mind a lot these days. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What has come into being through him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. God was not willing to sit idly by as the world spun into deeper and deeper darkness, and he still isn't. Christ and his church are God's response to the world's need for hope in the midst of despair. Christ is the gift of assurance that God is still at work to make everything right, even when all evidence seems to point to the contrary. His church and his true followers are the lampposts, the luminaries along the way when the world is lost in darkness, to say, this is the wrong way, but come and see that there is another way. Christ, as seen in the light of the lives of the truly faithful, shines in the midst of whatever darkness there is. Maybe it's just what we've seen in our country lately or what this whole last year did to us all. But I need the message again. I need that reminder. I need the invitation again. Come and see that the light of Christ still shines. No matter what we are facing, no matter how difficult things may seem, no matter the forces we think are bearing down on us and attempting to corrupt our country and our world, come and see that the light of Christ still shines. No matter how hard it is to keep the faith and adapt to another CDC recommendation, to cancel another plan, to do church and work and family life in a different way, come and see that the light of Christ still shines. Even when we find ourselves admitting that we believe this somehow in some part of ourselves, but we still cry out asking the Lord to help the parts of us still trapped in unbelief, come and see the light of Christ still shine. And so in trying times like the ones in which we currently live, we come to Jesus again. We accept the invitation to turn to the light. We live in the light. We point others to the light. And like candles in a dark cave defying the darkness to try to overcome them, we bear witness to all that we know to be true because we know that the light of Christ has not been overcome to this point, and it will not be overcome now. We're in the season after Epiphany. And I've heard the experience of that season, and in some ways the time that leads all the way through Easter, as if it were a dimmer on a light switch. The light starts low with the light of only a single star in the night sky to guide the Magi, but with each week, the light grows. Now there's certainly a moment on Good Friday when it feels like darkness has won. But as the famous sermon phrase states, Sunday's coming. Resurrection light cannot be overcome. 
Not by a mob of extremists, not by a lie, not by a conspiracy theorist and those who are so lost in their own darkness that they will buy what they are selling just to feel seen and accepted as part of the group. As long as there are those who cling to Christ, the light will always win. But let's be honest. Sometimes letting the light shine from within seems too much. It feels harder than ever now. A global pandemic wasn't enough. The loss of all that we thought we could depend on for stability wasn't enough. A contentious presidential election wasn't enough. Holidays without the opportunity to hug our families and friends wasn't enough. And just when we thought we couldn't get any worse, we saw on January 6th that it could get worse than many of us ever imagined. And even with the hope that a vaccine might soon be available to everyone, or the promise that always comes with the start of a new year, or moving into a different chapter in our nation's history, you and I both know it may continue to get worse before it gets better. And we also know that we are called to come to the light of Christ's love, and we are called to shine with the light of Christ's love, no matter how hard it gets. Now, this is where I wish that I had the capacity to turn a sermon into a Nick Saban halftime speech. But I have no adjustments to offer that will help us defend against the pressure collapsing in on us, or trick plays to press on toward the goal that the enemy won't see coming. All I can say is that I know you're tired. How could you not be? I know it may feel like it is all too much to overcome. I know it may feel like it is easier to give up. It may feel like the embers of your internal fire are going to give out at any moment. But this is the time to turn the light up. We must turn to Christ and turn the light of his love up as bright as it can possibly be for the world to see. If each of us does that, we can remain faithful and impact our world in the way that is needed right now. That's why a fellowship like our church is so important. We're not alone. We have each other to turn to when it feels like the responsibilities of the faithful life are more than we can bear. We are still bound together in common faith, in common purpose, and in common mission. And what I see in each of you makes me want to shine brighter because I know you, you refuse to stop shining. I'll shine for you because I know you'll shine for me and we'll shine together. And the world needs the light we have to offer now more than ever in my lifetime. Only by turning to the light of our Christ-given love will the world know that what we are experiencing right now is not sane or normal or okay. Only by turning up the light enough to show them that there is a way out of the darkness will the world actually take a different path. If light truly is the best disinfectant, then only by shining with the light of Christ in our homes, our neighborhoods, our workplaces, our schools, and everywhere else will the hateful disease that we see everywhere be healed. Only by letting your light shine will the world that becomes less and less trusting of the church each day be able to know that those who carried the symbols of Christ with them as they stormed the Capitol building couldn't have been more misguided and lost in darkness or farther away from what Christ would have wanted. Only by letting your light shine now and in the days to come will we be able to move forward, heal our communities, and move into a brighter future. It feels like we are in the midst of a land of deep darkness right now. But the world has been in deep darkness before. And the light of Christ and his truly faithful followers always shines in the darkness. And the darkness will not and cannot overcome it. So keep shining. Whatever it takes, figure out how to come to Jesus again and keep shining. Grieve, lament, pray, mourn, cry until you have no more tears. Find the rest you desperately need. But also remember that it is always in the darkest places that Christ shows up, giving us the light we need. And he always calls his light bearers, his church, to go there with him, to come and see what his light can do and shine with him into the world. I will never forget this past Christmas Eve, unlike any other. We gathered in our parking lot in the rain at our church. Most everyone was in their cars listening as we broadcast over the radio. The worship leaders were under the portico, 
And we actually had one family that was determined to sit in their tailgating chairs in the rain under their umbrellas. If you can do it at a football game, you can do it on Christmas Eve. We didn't do candles this year. But at the end of the service, as our music minister sang Silent Night, I held up the light on my phone and I peered out into the darkness through the rain. And from the darkness, coming through car windows and out from under umbrellas, I saw one light after another click on. It pierced the darkness. It was beautiful and holy. It was a reminder that in difficult times when enough light pierces the darkness, hope is always found. Come and see the light again. And then go back into the world and shine on, my sisters and brothers. Shine on. The world needs you. Remember the light of Christ within you. And when you find it anew, turn it up as bright as you can. Let it shine, shine, shine. Let it shine. Amen.